Welcome to St. Paul's Lutheran Church. We pray that the Word of God will strengthen your faith and that your worship with us will bring joy to your hearts and lives. We are glad to have you join us. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve Him as His dear children. But we have disobeyed Him and deserve only His wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to Him and plead for His mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against You and do not deserve to be called Your child. But trusting in Jesus my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to Your unfailing love. Cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. Amen. Let us pray. God of all power and might, you are the giver of all that is good. Help us love you with all our heart. Strengthen us in true faith. Provide us with all we need and keep us safe in your care. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. God's Word does not always seem to be so powerful and effective. In fact, most of the world rejects it and, and treats it with contempt. And yet, even in the outward shame and weakness, God's Word is powerful and does change hearts and lives for eternity. It works in the hearts of dead sinners to give them life and life eternal. The first lesson for the seventh Sunday after Pentecost is recorded in the book of the prophet Ezekiel chapter 2. He said to me, a son of man, stand up on your feet and I will speak to you. As he spoke, the spirit came into me and raised me to my feet and I heard him speaking to me. He said, son of man, I am sending you to the Israelites, to a rebellious nation that has rebelled against me. They and their fathers have been in revolt against me to this very day. The people to whom I am sending you are obstinate and stubborn. Say to them, this is what the Sovereign Lord says. And whether they listen or fail to listen, for they are a rebellious house, they will know that a prophet has been among them. This is the word of the Lord. The psalm of the day is Psalm 143. O Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my cry for mercy. In your faithfulness and righteousness, come to my relief. Do not bring your servant into judgment, for no one living is righteous before you. My spirit grows faint within me. My heart within me is dismayed. Answer me quickly, O Lord. Do not hide your face from me. In the morning, bring me word of your unfailing love, for I have put my trust in you. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. May your good spirit lead me on level ground. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. The second lesson is recorded in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning with verse 7. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the word of the Lord. Alleluia. Happy are they who hear the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart, and bring forth fruit with patience. 
Alleluia. The gospel is recorded in Mark chapter 6, beginning with verse 1. Jesus left there and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. Where did this man get these things, they asked? What's this wisdom that has been given him, that he even does miracles? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Jesus said to them, Only in his hometown, among his relatives, and in his own house, is a prophet without honor. He could not do any miracles there, except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. This is the gospel of our Lord. We confess the Christian faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
grace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God for our meditation is our gospel reading recorded in Mark chapter 6. My dear Christian friends, now faith is always a miracle. And how amazing the power of God's Word is. Now, through the Gospel, the Holy Spirit creates faith. He sustains that faith. And even in circumstances that we would consider impossible, the Gospel is able to work faith in the hard hearts of sinners like us who by nature were dead in sin, who by nature reject God's Word as foolishness, And even when the outward circumstances seem impossible then, faith trusts. Now consider Jairus from last week's Gospel reading. When he received word that his daughter had died, Jesus said to him, don't be afraid, just believe. Jesus' word has the miraculous power to sustain faith, to calm fear, even in the most difficult of circumstances, even in the face of death, in which Jesus always fulfills His Word. Now how amazing His Word is. Now while faith takes a miracle, unbelief is not somehow a, a, a rational alternative. Unbelief takes a blatant, utterly wicked refusal to consider the facts. Consider the people of Nazareth. Despite overwhelming evidence that Jesus was the promised Messiah, they rejected Him. There's no sin they knew of that He had ever committed. There's nothing to accuse Him of. Instead, they know of His wisdom and His mighty works, but in spite of all of that, they reject. They fail to listen to His message. Really, it's irrational. In fact, we're told that Jesus, even with his understanding of sinful human nature, marveled at their unbelief. Amazing unbelief. And we will note Nazareth's excuse for that unbelief and be warned ourselves not to follow their example. Now, Jesus, as he regularly did, was teaching in the synagogue. Here he's in the, his hometown of Nazareth. And a visiting rabbi or teacher such as Jesus was, was generally asked to to get up and to speak and supposed to give a sermon. And what a wonderful opportunity for those people. They had the opportunity to hear God's word spoken to them by God's own Son, the promised Savior Jesus. Mark doesn't record for us Jesus' message but Luke gives us some details about Jesus' sermon. And as we would expect, Jesus pointed to Himself as the promised Savior. And what a wonderful message that would have been for these people to hear. This was good news. The the Gospel from the Savior's own lips. The Savior promised in the Old Testament was here. That would have been the most wonderful news they could have heard. Certainly something that they were looking forward to. And at first it seems it sounded pretty good to them. And as regular attenders at the synagogue, they knew the Old Testament prophecies about the Savior. They should have been looking for Him to come. God had said through the prophet Moses, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I command. If anyone does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name, I myself will call him to account. Well, the people of Nazareth recognized Jesus' teaching as being something special. They recognized the, the wisdom and power of His teaching. They knew about His miracles. Perhaps some had even witnessed one or more of those miracles themselves. They couldn't deny those things. They probably would have agreed with Nicodemus. Nicodemus told Jesus, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God. For no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. But then came the questions and the doubts. They began to wonder, how could Jesus be the Messiah? They all knew who he was. 
He was no different than they were. He was Mary's son from down the street. He was a carpenter. Uh, they knew his family. In their mind, there was nothing special about him. So looking at those externals, they concluded that he couldn't be the Messiah. And in unbelief, they rejected him. And their response was in many ways typical. How often that can be the case. Someone we, we knew as a child, it can sometimes be hard to accept them in a position of authority or prestige. Remember things that they did as a child, the, the trouble maybe that they got into, the problems that they caused. But in Jesus' case, knowing Jesus as a child should only have strengthened their recognition of Him as a Savior. But Jesus was perfect even as a child. There were no times He misbehaved, no rebellious years, no little indiscretions, nothing that they could point to or hold against Him. Jesus was perfect. But the people of Nazareth, despite all the evidence to the fact that Jesus is the promised Savior, they rejected Him. We read near the beginning of John's Gospel, He was in the world, and though the world was made through Him, the world did not recognize Him. He came to that which was His own, but His own did not receive Him. Yet to all who received Him, to those who believed in His name, he gave the right to become children of God. And in this case, even Jesus was amazed at their unbelief. Well, that message that Jesus is the Savior promised in the Old Testament, promised from the fall into sin, that message, that promise has also been given to us. And how will we respond? But beware of following Nazareth's example. Again, unbelief is not a reasonable conclusion based upon intelligent observation of the facts. It isn't based on science or logic. In fact, it's really quite the opposite. Unbelief is the choice of our sinful human will which persists blindly in spite of the facts. Now, since the fall into sin, our wills are bound in unbelief until the Holy Spirit miraculously calls us to faith. Now, the Apostle Paul tells us, no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And by nature, we reject the message of the Gospel, just as those people of Nazareth. By nature, we couldn't accept Jesus any more than they did. Now, Paul writes to the Corinthians that the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. On our own, we, we couldn't accept that this man, Jesus, could be our Savior from sin. But through the power of the Word, the Holy Spirit has created faith in our hearts so that we do believe Jesus, that He is the promised Messiah. But still, the temptation is there for us to treat His Word lightly. A familiarity breeds contempt, saying those. I pray that that never be true of the Gospel message for us. Now how easy it can be for us to think, well, we've heard about the perfect life of Jesus. We've heard about His death on the cross as our substitute. We've heard that enough. We know that, huh? Why do we need to come to church to hear it again? Certainly not every Sunday. But that's the only message which saves. We can never hear it too often. It can never become too familiar. Now for those of us maybe who have grown up knowing Jesus all our life, how easy to think we know Him so well, and yet how easy to take that for granted. Now consider what an amazing surprising message the gospel is. Huh? For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. Now, are we still surprised by that? How amazing that God would love a world of sinners and give His own Son for their salvation. May we never cease to be amazed by God's grace or take it for granted. 
And Jesus spoke his words to those who were gathered at the synagogue in Nazareth, to those who know, knew the Old Testament scriptures. And again, Jesus speaks to us, many of us who have known Jesus in the Bible from little on. How important to re, for us to be regular in our church attendance, regular in our study of God's Word, that we might grow in that faith. Now just as a person can develop bad habits, it's also possible for a person to develop those good habits. And we want to work on developing those good habits of weekly church attendance, regular Bible class attendance, daily personal and family devotions. Honey, we can never hear our Savior speak too often, never know His Word too well. No, we need again and again to hear, to hear God's law condemn us as the miserable sinners that we are. Because we don't like to think we're all that bad. We need that so that we might then be ready to receive again and again that sweet comfort of the Gospel. That we have a Savior who has rescued us from sin by His life and death. And we need that Word to guide us in our daily living. And not only do we face the temptation to think Jesus' words too familiar and to neglect that word, but we also face the temptation to, to try and make his word was always reasonable to our way of thinking. There are those things in God's word that just don't make sense to human logic, that aren't according to our way of thinking. At times we want to change his word so that it does fit with our thoughts and our desires. Those teachings must be accepted by faith. Our human reason must always be made subject to God's Word. Those, there are those teachings of His Word that certainly are unpopular in our world today. Temptation is to overlook those, those doctrines. The temptation to consider them less important, not necessary. Uh, we're tempted to treat Jesus' word lightly. Especially when we look and the outward circumstances seem to say that that word isn't working. When so many reject. But Jesus gave his word for our salvation. That word is an amazing power to change hearts and lives now and for eternity. It's the only means that we have been given by God for salvation. Now the Apostle Paul tells us that faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the Word of Christ. Now, at times, aren't we tempted to find God's Word a, a, a burden for our lives? That we know how God wants us to live, but it doesn't quite fit with what we want, at least not at that time. So we think, well, I, I know it's wrong, I know it's against God's word, but, and the excuses follow. Everything else, well, everyone else is doing it, really isn't that bad. Jesus will understand and forgive. And yet, anytime we fall victim to any of those temptations, really not doing anything different than following the example of those people of Nazareth. We're letting our familiarity with Jesus and his word be used as a license to reject that word, to reject Him. And what God wants for us, what He desires, is to bless us through our obedience. And we're told here that in Nazareth, Jesus was not able to do any miracles, except to heal a few. The result of their unbelief, they, was, they didn't come to Him for help. They didn't ask. They didn't want His help. They didn't recognize Him as Savior. And so in their unbelief, they forfeited the blessings that God wanted to give to them. Now God wants to bless us as well. Our sin and our unfaithfulness can forfeit those blessings that God intends for us. Temptation can be for us to think that we deserve those blessings, maybe even more than others. Christians who attend church regularly, who support the work of the church. So why doesn't God give us a few more things that we want? It's good for us to remember that we don't deserve any special treatment from God. Everything we receive is a gift of His grace. He's given to us His Word to bless us. He's already given us the greatest blessing that anyone could ever have. 
we have forgiveness of sins and we have a certain hope of eternal life in heaven. The Christian life will not always be one of ease and pleasure. Poverty and suffering are, are not signs of a lack of faith. Like the Lord disciplines those He loves. He's promised that He's with us, that He will provide for us, and that He will bless us through His Word. And so, we for our part will study and learn and cherish His Word. And may we learn from the example of the people of Nazareth and, and from Israel in many ways in general. They rejected the Word and because of their rejection, the Word and its blessings were taken away from them and given to others. We're never told of Jesus ever again returning to Nazareth after this. I cherish that word that by God's grace we may never lose that word. Now, as amazing as the unbelief of those people in Nazareth might be, even more amazing is the grace of our Lord Jesus. After being rejected, Jesus didn't just leave Nazareth in a huff, didn't curse and destroy it. In fact, he stayed around long enough for those few who who did believe in Him to come and, and seek Him out in private and to receive His help. And certainly Jesus is true. God would have known that the people of Nazareth were going to reject Him, but in grace, He still came and spoke that precious gospel message to them. He knew that He would be dishonored, but He came anyway. He came to earth, He came to Israel, He came to Nazareth, he came to rescue us from an eternity in hell. Even though by nature we rejected Him, He didn't reject us. He came to live a perfect life for us. He came to go to the cross to suffer and die in our place that we might have eternal life. The Apostle Paul writes to the Romans, You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And what great assurance He's given to us as He comes to us with His forgiveness, with life and salvation. What patience, what compassion, what love, what a great comfort for you and for me. The facts are clear. Jesus is the Savior. And his resurrection from the dead is the greatest evidence that everything that He taught, everything that He claimed, it's all true. And we can believe. He doesn't call on us simply to blindly believe. But the facts point to the fact Jesus is the Savior. Same time, amazing unbelief. They're in the people of Nazareth. But again, even more amazing is the grace of God which moved Him to send the Holy Spirit to work faith in our hearts so that we might believe. Praise be to our Savior Jesus. And may our prayer always be, Lord, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, our Maker and Preserver, we praise and thank You for all that You give us day after day. We are not worthy of all the mercies You show us. You have given us Your precious Word to nourish our souls and to protect us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature. We thank You for those who teach and preach Your saving truth at this place and everywhere. Grant them a rich measure of patience, wisdom, and love. Heavenly Father, we pray that you shield us from every kind of danger, sudden catastrophe, terrors of crime, and the pain of disease. Watch over those who travel by land, sea, and air. Keep our loved ones from whatever perils may threaten them. Heal those who are sick, cheer those who are sad, calm those who are distressed, and comfort all who are old and infirm. 
bless our land, our people, and those who hold offices of high trust. Keep our government and schools upright and strong for the advancement of good citizenship and useful vocations, that we may enjoy your gifts of peace, security, and well-being. Grant your blessing to every nation on earth. Where there are wars, may there be peace. Where there is hatred, let it be healed. Where there is poverty, danger, or disaster, come with your almighty power to help and restore. We bring these requests before you in the name of Jesus our Lord and ask you to hear us. Take all that we have, our bodies and minds, our time and skills, our ministries and offerings, and use them to your glory. We give ourselves to you that we may serve you in whatever way is pleasing in your sight. Amen. And we pray the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation and bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen.